Well, you're a fool, Potter. But at least you're a kind one. Don't lose that. Slaves don't want to be slaves. Well, if you go to Azkaban, I guess I'll break you out, Sirius says with a wink. A prophecy of a new Dark Lord approaching, Harry thinks. Perhaps Harry was meant to take Voldemort's place. Maybe Harry could be so much worse, if that were possible. Hey there! So, we've been rewriting the original Harry Potter stories in an effort to learn from them and grow our skills, especially in light of J.K. Rowling's actions and stances that are making lives in the trans community more difficult. Because the world needs more kindness, and we need to be better writers. In the first video, link below, we went through all seven books, pointing out some of the big issues and coming up with solutions to the same problems while avoiding as many of the pitfalls as we could. Now in part two, let's actually use it all. Let's tell that story. Again, trans rights are human rights, and if you can, please donate to The Trevor Project, link below. They run support and crisis lines for the LGBTQ community, which puts them on the front lines, dealing with the results of the recent wave of transphobia the world is currently facing. They deserve all the help they can get. Now, in the first four books, most of the changes we've made are a mix of world-building decisions and just noticing certain story points that aren't currently paid off. So for these, the plots themselves are mostly unaltered, and I won't repeat and tell those books beat by beat. Instead, just imagine those first four books as is, and we'll quickly run through any points that we need to notice and or change. Before getting into book five, where things will get a little more interesting. Thank you so much for being with me, and let's begin. Previously on Traveller of Places. Book one, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. So first off, the overall narration will not be so mean about things. The Dursleys are shown to be horrible for their legitimately cruel actions, not for being overweight. Likewise, Hagrid and Trelawney later on are not the butt of the joke for being alcoholics. When we meet the goblins, they are not long-nosed, long-fingered, long-toed, money-grubbing evil creatures. They are still untrusted by the wizarding world, but that's because of cultural tensions between humans and goblins. They deal with money, largely because the humans have accepted their cave systems are the perfect safe houses for valuable items, such as gold, and over the centuries the goblins have carved out successful businesses in this niche as a result. Basically, the story doesn't portray them in a bigoted light, but rather as existing within a bigoted system, which is shown to be as such. The Sorting Hat's decisions are not a permanently logged in judgement, this is how you are for the rest of your life, and none of them are actually provably evil. Instead, they're simply chosen as the most likely groups for children, thrown into a new and scary place, to make friends. It is uncommon for people to change houses, but does happen once or twice every other year. There is still a stigma around Slytherin though, as so many dark wizards and witches have come from there. Ron still explains as such, and the Sorting Hat still tells Harry that Slytherin would lead him to greatness. Again, this scares him. Later, when Harry is given detention and ventures into the dark forest, meeting the shadowy figure, the one we learn to be Voldemort, floating separate from Quirrell's body, the shade briefly touches Harry's skin, causing Harry immense pain in his scar, but also burning the creature, just as Ferenz the centaur arrives to save him. Neither Harry nor the Dark Lord understand why the burning happened, and Voldemort thinks it's to do with his ghostly form touching a living thing without a physical body of his own. The real reason though, we learn at the end of the year, is that Harry is magically protected through his mother's sacrifice. Voldemort cannot touch him. The rest of the book carries on as before, Hagrid still gets a dragon, Norbert, later found to be Norberta, who is sent to live in Romania with her own kind. Harry and co still defeat Voldemort via hand-wavy loveburn powers, and the school is saved. What we don't know at the time though, is Voldemort has returned this year via Quirrell's use of the first Horcrux, a pocket watch that once belonged to Tom Riddle's father. Book 2, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. We open as current, Harry harassed by Dobby, stealing the car, breaking into Hogwarts and leaving Ron's wand broken. They're caught and interrogated by Snape, only to be saved by Dumbledore and Professor McGonagall. We'll discuss a suitable punishment at a later date, she tells them, but I must impress upon you the seriousness of this situation. By this point, Harry has already offered Molly Weasley some money to help his new surrogate family buy school books and pay for his lodging. However, this is turned down, with a cheerful, Oh, don't worry, dear, we're fine. Now, are you hungry? But he still wants to help. Ron's broken wand then leads to the same slug curse backfiring after Malfoy calls Hermione a mudblood. 
For the explanation of what Mudblood means, though, we're going to leave out the bit about Hermione being a real witch because she gets good grades, compared to Neville, a pureblood who doesn't. That's not why she's a witch. She's a witch because she just is. But we do still have Draco calling Hermione a mudblood to introduce the pureblood slash wizarding supremacy idea that builds throughout the series. This slug curse, though, triggers Harry to try and help his friend again. Ron can't live the rest of his life with a broken wand. He seeks help from McGonagall, who agrees to tweak the school rules slightly in this one occurrence. She buys Ron a wand, delivers it mysteriously via Owl, just like she did with Harry's broomstick, but this time Harry pays. Ron's new wand is not perfectly aligned to him, but it's good enough for schooling, and can be traded in at the end of the year at Ollivander's. But because it's not perfectly aligned, he still carries the old one, for sentimental reasons. Both his friends tease him about this. And once the wand is delivered, the punishment for the car incident at the start of the year is decided. According to the school rules, damages must be paid to the victims. The victims in question being both the school and the car's owners, the Weasleys. The school fines are replaced by work and detention, but the car's fines are not, and must be paid in cash. But since Ron is already a part of the victim's family, he is not monetarily charged, leaving Harry with the bill, paid to the Weasleys as was Harry's plan. McGonagall explains this to both Harry and Ron. Ron complains, but Harry plays along. No, it's fine, he says. They'll expel us if we don't. It's all good. She gives Ron the note to take to the Owlery, explaining to Ron's parents and having the funds moved. Once he's gone, though, she smiles at Harry. Is this plan really wise? Surely there are simpler ways. He shrugs back. I tried, but they wouldn't accept my help otherwise. Thanks, Professor. Well, you're a fool, Potter. But at least you're a kind one. Don't lose that. He laughs. I won't. The audience know the fines are made up. Likely the Weasleys do as well, but under the circumstances, and as broke as they are, they accept. When Harry visits the Weasleys from then on, though, he notices Molly add a little more food to his plate. He's never had a motherly figure act like that before. At the end of the year, Lockhart still takes Ron's wand, but instead of grabbing the functional one in his hand, he grabs the broken one in his pocket, leading to the Obliviate curse backfiring. Voldemort is still defeated, having almost returned with his second Horcrux, the diary, and Harry still uses the diary to free Dobby, via a secretly hidden sock. Dobby is free. Book 3, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. When we first meet Ron and his family this year, in place of the Weasleys having just returned from a random trip to Egypt they somehow won, instead we learn that Ron's brother Charlie has won an award for his work with dragons. Specifically, his work with the dragon Norberta, the one Hagrid had hatched in Book 1, and who Charlie has successfully integrated into the colony with stunning success. Thanks to the funds Harry gave them last year, the whole family is able to visit for the award ceremony. The family photo is put on the front page of the Daily Prophet, with the caption, Big future ahead for Dragon Trainer and his family. This picture is what Sirius sees, and where he notices Scabbers as the secret Animagus Pettigrew. Secondly, Remus Lupin did not receive the Curse of the Werewolf from Fenrir Greyback, targeting him as a child. In fact, Greyback is not included at all in the story. Instead, while Remus did receive the curse as a little kid, it was just a random attack, more like a run-in with a bear, rather than an intentional spread of the werewolf curse. Snape, for all he hates Lupin, is still seen to help him by making potions that grant Remus full mental control while in wolf form, and also totally prevents the curse from spreading. Otherwise, the year plays out more or less as is. We still introduce the Time Turners, which Hermione uses to take extra classes, and later to save Sirius and Buckbeak. Book 4, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. The opening attack on the Quidditch World Cup still goes ahead, leading to Barty Crouch Sr. dismissing his slave, Winky. But in our version, slaves don't want to be slaves. Some are institutionalized, some are scared of being alone in the world, or convinced that leaving the safety of slavery can mean death, as all of these things do regularly happen to people constantly living in bad or abusive situations. Just institutionalized. Winky is one such elf, but Dobby helps her get a job in the Hogwarts kitchens. They offer her a place to live, a wage, community, and safety. All of this is a lot for her to take in though, and causes some crying meltdowns. But she works through it. This also triggers Hermione into becoming an activist. 
and the good guys don't argue that she's wrong to do it. The non-human sentient races, such as goblins, house elves and centaurs, are still not allowed wands, as this is how the wizards keep power over them. Many individuals from those races are, obviously, unhappy with this. The Triwizard Cup happens as usual, Harry falls for Cho Chang, and eventually winds up in the graveyard, with Cedric Diggory dead, as the Death Eaters use Harry's blood, some bones, and the third Horcrux, a locket, to bring Voldemort back to life. Harry and Voldemort's wands, sharing their phoenix feather core, still meet in battle and summon the ghosts of Harry's life, the souls of that family he never got to know, and together they help the boy escape. With Harry's blood mixed into the Dark Lord's veins, any protection Harry had is now gone. Voldemort can touch him without fear. Tell him the bitch is back. And this is where things will start a changing. So, buckle up, kids. We're in for a wild ride. <laughs> Book 5 Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. In the opening scene, Harry is attacked by Dementors, fights them off, and for the use of underage magic, is instantly expelled from Hogwarts. Once safe though, the Order of the Phoenix, the good guys, find him, and he's whisked away to Grimmauld Place. When Harry first enters the house, he sees the walls covered with the heads of old house elf slaves, trophy style. But half of them are obviously missing, with gaps in the walls and faded outlines where they used to hang. In the back garden, out through the kitchen windows, he notices a few small mounds of churned earth, each just large enough for a house elves grave. With the help of Creature and Dobby, Hermione's been organizing the slow burials of the old house elves owned by Sirius's less than loving family. Creature isn't fond of the idea, change is difficult for him, but he knew some of the elves personally, so takes charge of digging the graves himself. Dobby's in charge of burial customs, as Hermione doesn't know what their traditions are and wants to be respectful. But Dobby has been tight-lipped about what they should do, and it's slowing the whole process down. That's when Harry turns up, and as they're chatting one night, killing time while the adults bicker among themselves, Dobby reveals, with no small embarrassment, that he doesn't actually know their traditions. House elves have been separated and enslaved so long that most customs have been lost. So Harry suggests that Dobby makes up new customs, still acknowledge that the old ways have been lost, but if Dobby wants a more free world for house elves, they'll need traditions that reflect that new life. Those traditions need to come from someone like Dobby, and that's where every tradition starts, with someone dreaming it up. Dobby likes this idea, he buries a sock and some berries with each grave, clothes to mark their freedom in the afterlife, and some food so they can enjoy it. Also, Creature is employed by the good guys, not enslaved. He's still kind of unpleasant to have around, not the nicest guy, but slowly he's getting used to this new life. Meanwhile, Harry is worried about what may happen at his trial. Everything feels like it's falling apart. He hides in the first empty room he comes across. The walls are covered in faces and names, though many are burned away. Sirius finds him sitting in the corner and gives him a hug. Never like this room, he says, and explains that the room itself, the walls, the faces and names, all constitute the Black Family Tree. He points to a scorch mark by the door, where a portrait once stood. That's me. My mother did that, when I ran away. Charming woman. Sirius realizes his distraction isn't helping much, and looks Harry in the eyes. Hey, it's okay. It's going to be okay. What if it isn't? Harry asks. This trial, what if I lose? What then? Well, if you go to Azkaban, I guess I'll break you out, he says with a wink. Harry stops. Could that happen? Sirius smiles, and then hesitates. Honestly, I don't know. Normally, no, but the Ministry... All I can promise you is that every one of us has your back. No matter what happens, we'll be there. I'll be there, okay? Harry nods. Okay, thanks. In the following days at Grimmauld Place, Remus and Tonks are seen to be close with each other, often playing cards in their downtime. Both are usually cheating. The game is not to win, but to cheat without being caught, outthink the other person. Surprisingly, neither are very good at it. Both Molly and Sirius give them increasingly wild ideas on how to cheat, 
which fail spectacularly and almost always end in laughter, just as Molly and Sirius intended. Then Harry visits the Ministry for his trial of underage wizardry. We see the statue in the main hall, the wizard and witch standing over the other magical races, helping to cement that the entire system is already built with wizard supremacy in mind. The minister makes his views plain during the trial. He's terrified of Voldemort's return and refuses to acknowledge the danger. You know who is not back, the minister commands, like he could simply will it to be so. Any words to the otherwise are blatant lies and will not be tolerated in this court. Unknown to Harry and his friends though, Voldemort supporters are already largely in control of the Ministry, most notably in the character of Umbridge, who supports the Minister for Magic directly because his fearful actions allow Voldemort power. She believes that to question the Minister is to question the Dark Lord's will. She wants Harry expelled, as doing so would remove what she sees as Voldemort's primary threat. It's not an open dictatorship yet, but the Death Eaters are in charge more than anyone else, thus allowing them to clear the building and keep the doors open for the fight at the end of the year. The current Minister for Magic, however, does not know this. His fear has blinded him to the actions of those around him. Alas for Umbridge, Dumbledore appears at the trial, arguing in Harry's defence, and the charges are dropped. In doing this, however, Dumbledore is placed squarely in Umbridge's sights. Then we're off to Hogwarts! Most of the book continues as usual. Umbridge takes control of Hogwarts, champions the minister's fearful no spell defense classes, and so forces Harry and his friends to create Dumbledore's army to train themselves. They secretly meet in the Room of Requirement, coordinating through the use of magical galleons that signal when to meet. All the while, Dumbledore is avoiding Harry, and he doesn't know why. This is especially isolating as Harry is having visions of Voldemort, but is at a loss as to what to do about it. On one such night, he sees Arthur Weasley attacked in the dark halls of the Ministry. But Arthur is not alone. Beside him stands and fights two of Ron's brothers, Percy and Charlie. Harry warns McGonagall about what he's seen, and it's through her they reach Dumbledore, triggering a search. The three men are soon found, all severely wounded. The rescuers consider taking them straight to St. Mungo's Hospital, but cannot risk the main entrance without backup. It's open to the street, the only place in the hospital that can be apparated into. There's no doubt the Death Eaters know this. To apparate into a possible den of snakes is suicide. Instead, all three are brought first to Grimmauld Place, where they can then flu powder as a group to a safer entrance. The wounded reach the house shortly after Harry, Ron, Hermione, and the other Weasleys arrive via flu powder from Dumbledore's office, which is also the only fireplace in the school that is so connected. Unfortunately, Percy is already dead when they arrive. Arthur dies in Molly's arms with his children around him. Harry and Hermione watch on, both feeling helpless. Charlie is stronger though. They manage to brace him enough for the trip, and he survives. It's noted that were it not for Harry's visions, Charlie would be dead as well. Later that night at Grimmauld Place, the room toasts Harry, but he feels like a failure for not getting help to them sooner. If he had, maybe the other two could have been saved. The Weasleys hold a funeral for Arthur and Percy. Afterwards, Ron is distraught. Harry and Hermione too, but they do their best to comfort Ron as they can. Distract him, tell jokes, or just sit with him in silence whatever he needs. That's when Harry notices a look in Hermione's eye. When Ron's out of the room, he catches her pouring through her books. What are you doing? Studying? Harry asks. Mogwortweed, she says. Have you heard of it? No? What? Harry replies. Mogwortweed. Prepared correctly, it slows poison in the body, stops bleeding, heals most magical wounds. Did you know that? No? Was I meant to? I didn't either, says Hermione. It grows in the park a block away. All it needs is a simple charm to work. And I didn't know that. Me, I didn't know that. So you can't know everything. Then what good am I? Hermione yells, tears on her cheeks. If I had known, Percy and Mr. Weasley might have survived. I know things, that's what I do. And I didn't and they're dead. So what, you're trying to learn everything there ever was just in case you need it? Harry sits down beside her. Hermione, the world is not on your shoulders alone, or mine, or anyone's, 
he says. If I'd had my visions earlier, they might have survived. If they brought more backup, they might have survived. If they'd risked the main entrance. If, if, if. You can't do that to yourself. So, what? So these things happen sometimes. It's not on you alone to fix the world. Everyone else is a part of that fight too. She thinks for a minute, then glares at him. Do you really believe that? He pauses, then laughs sadly. No, <laughs> no, of course not. Unlike you, I did screw up. I should have been quicker. It's my fault. You know that's not true. In some ways, just as much as you do. They sit in silence. I'll make you a deal, Harry says. You don't beat yourself up, and I won't either. She smiles. All right, deal. He leaves her to her thoughts, and she opens another book. Returning to Hogwarts, Harry begins lessons with Snape, controlling his mind, working with memories. They don't last long. The two don't work well together, and on one night after hours of tiring practice, a reactor spell from Harry buries into Snape's own thoughts. He sees a young Snape fighting James Potter, the two teenagers at odds, much like Draco and Harry have been so regularly. Snape ejects him back into reality, and they don't hold another lesson. Weeks pass by. Harry falls for Cho Chang, and they start dating, shortly followed by Draco Malfoy joining Umbridge's Inquisitor Squad, trying to break up the secret militia training regime. Dumbledore's army continue their hidden work as the Inquisitors grow steadily closer, and Umbridge takes increasing power. Until finally, the group is found, because Cho Chang outed them. Only later do we learn she was tricked, drugged with a truth serum. This leads Dumbledore himself to take the blame and flee Hogwarts, Umbridge moving into his office. Dumbledore's got style. Then Harry has another vision, Sirius in danger, tortured in the heart of the Ministry of Magic. With Dumbledore gone, replaced by Umbridge's iron fist, the members of Dumbledore's army decide to break out of Hogwarts, flying to the Ministry to save him. But when they arrive, they find the building deserted, the entrances unguarded. Without time to question such things, they reach the spot where Sirius is meant to be, amid the halls of prophecy. Only, he's not there. But there is a glowing ball with Harry's name on it. Curious, he picks it up, and hears a whispering voice in his mind. The one with the power to vanquish the Dark Lord approaches. Born to those who have thrice defied him, born as the seventh month dies. And the Dark Lord will face him as his equal, met with an age beyond years. Though he will have power, the Dark Lord knows not. But two cannot stand in the place of one, and neither can live while the other survives. Two cannot stand in the place of one. A prophecy of a new Dark Lord approaching, Harry thinks. Not a hero, but a rival. A man who could, perhaps, build an army of followers just like Harry, one who should have been in Slytherin, just like Harry, one strong enough to fight the most dangerous wizard on earth, just like Harry. Perhaps Harry was meant to take Voldemort's place, and that's why Voldemort tried to kill him as a child, stop the danger before it started. Maybe Harry could be so much worse, if that were possible. But before that can sink in, Death Eaters appear, led by Lucius Malfoy seeking the prophetic orb in Harry's hand. Fighting ensues. The teenagers charge through the halls, firing spells at the enemy, looking for a way out. And during this fight, they do not accidentally break every time machine in the world, because that is silly. Instead, Hermione, who spent a whole year working with and researching time travel, notices an enormous device as they run past it. It's several yards tall, made from thick copper rings, with gears to turn the massive hourglass in the center. But without time to linger, they run by. Harry and co. find themselves in the Death Chamber, a large empty cavern centered around an ominous archway, through which the dead do not return. Our heroes are surrounded by Death Eaters, losing the fight, when the cavalry arrives. Sirius lands by Harry's side and smiles at Lucius Malfoy. You left the doors unlocked. Thanks for that. And punches him in the face. Fighting erupts, dark versus light. During the commotion, the prophecy is broken. 
Then Sirius is hit by Bellatrix Lestrange's curse, killing him instantly. Harry stops fighting in shock and is blasted with Lucius's stunning spell. For as furious as he is at the prophecy's loss, the senior Malfoy would not lightly steal Harry's death from the Dark Lord. But Bellatrix would. She fires at Harry, now lying on the floor. Remus sees this and tries to block the shot, getting hit in the shoulder. He isn't dead, yet. But he is bleeding out fast. Tonks screams and starts firing madly. She takes out two Death Eaters, yelling at the others, We need to get out! The evacuation starts, but the onslaught is too great, and she's hit in the chest, falling, the life lost from her eyes. Harry sees his friends, dying, bleeding. Hermione gets to Remus and pulls out a vial of Mogwort weed, applying liberally. Harry, let's go! But Bellatrix is laughing. I killed Sirius Black! <laughs> And Harry, pissed off and recovered from the stun, runs after her, egged on by a voice. A dark voice. Voldemort's voice. Do it, Harry! You know the spell! Harry wants to, wants her dead, wants to make her pay for what she's taken from him. But before he can act, so appears Dumbledore, shocking Voldemort from Harry's side. Lestrange escapes as the two great wizards duel up and down the halls, trashing the Ministry as they do. All Harry can do is watch. But Dumbledore gets the upper hand, causing Voldemort to flee just as the Minister for Magic and his crew finally appear on the scene, seeing Voldemort and at last having to admit the Dark Lord has returned. The Minister resigns, leading to his second in command taking the role, Rufus Scrimgeour who also, unknown to the wizarding world, happens to be a devout Death Eater. He immediately starts implementing the early policies that lead to fascist rule. Checks, movement control, wand permits, all fairly lax in control, high in data collection, in the name of finding Voldemort and creating a safe, strong government. It starts openly, just as a means of knowing who does what, where, and is widely supported in the name of safety. But slowly, the Muggleborns will be denied those permits, and movement, and the punishments and incarcerations increase tenfold. Meanwhile, Harry and Dumbledore finally speak. Dumbledore apologizes for his actions, for abandoning Harry all year. He could tell Harry's connection to Voldemort was growing, that soon their minds could easily be invaded by the other, and hoped that by distancing himself from Harry, the Dark Lord would be less tempted to use such an avenue. Harry forgives the old man, at least in words. But this is the first time he's really doubted Dumbledore's methods. Abandoning Harry to figure things out by himself was the exact reason he went to the Ministry. It's why Sirius and Moore were dead. The feeling doesn't last though, and doubt soon returns to guilt. They were dead because Harry led everyone into that trap. The fault was his, and no other. The Order of the Phoenix hold a second set of funerals for their lost members. They stand over the graves, saying their pieces, until the service is over, and slowly the members leave, back to grim old place. One by one they go, until it's just Harry, with Ron and Hermione at his back, and one other figure standing between the graves of Tonks and Sirius. Ron and Hermione leave Harry to go talk to the man, Remus Lupin, his arm still in a sling. Hermione's quick thinking had saved his life, but it's unlikely he'll ever regain full use of his hand. Can I join you, Professor? Harry asks. Harry, I'm long past being your professor. Out here, I'm just Remus. Of course, Harry smiles, sadly. They stand there, looking at the graves. Can I ask, Remus, does it get easier? Losing people? Remus wipes his eyes. Some part of me would love to say yes, but... No, it doesn't get easier. Harry just nods, staring at Sirius's gravestone. Good. I don't think I want it to. Remus smirks. Wise beyond your years, <laughs> as always, my friend. They stand there, silently, beside their fallen loved ones. Tears rest upon both their cheeks but not another word is spoken. Sometimes words just aren't good enough. And that's where book five ends.
As you can see, with each year of the story, we're starting to veer further and further away from the source material, in order to pay off as many of the earlier promises as we can. In part 3, we're going to get into book 6, The Half-Blood Prince, where things are going to get a little bit... Wibbly wobbly. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you have a lovely day, and I'll see you there.